The GTO vs Exploitative Cold War is over. Yes, there are a select few that continue to wage this war, primarily those who either do not understand game theory or that profit off of ignorance, but this debate is now largely one-sided. As far as I'm aware, there is no player that actually understands game theory who believes that exploitative information should be totally ignored when it's available. While it is true that you can become a winning player by utilizing a purely GTO or a purely exploitative style, the truth is, to maximize your EV, regardless of the stakes or type of game you play, you should become proficient at both. Some abstracted form of GTO should serve as your foundation, and exploitative adjustments should be layered on top when appropriate. And we can learn how to effectively do both by using solvers. As most of you know, the primary function of a solver is to calculate unexploitable GTO strategies. But solvers can also calculate strategies that maximally exploit an opponent's known weakness through its node locking feature, which we'll demonstrate in this video. Now to explain what node locking is, it may make sense to refresh our recollection on how GTO strategies are calculated by a solver. Simply put, a solver calculates the GTO strategies for two players, let's call them player A and player B, by simulating a hand scenario billions of times over. In each iteration that's played, the solver gradually shifts each player's strategies towards plays that make the most chips and away from the strategies that lose the most chips until it reaches the point that no further chips can be made on average by changing either player's strategies further. This point is referred to as the Nash Equilibrium, and the resulting strategies are commonly known as Game Theory Optimal, which cannot be improved assuming neither player shifts his strategies, which he will have no incentive to unilaterally do. But what happens when our assumption is wrong and player B deviates from his perfect GTO strategy because he knows no better? Well, in most cases, this will mean that player A's GTO strategy will no longer be the best strategy that maximizes his expectation against player B. Player A's GTO strategy will still be effective and unexploitable, but it will no longer be the most profitable. And this is where node locking comes into play. Node locking allows us to isolate player B's deviation from GTO and then recalculate the strategies for player A to identify the actions that will maximize his profits against player B's leak. Sounds amazing, right? Well, although node locking is an extremely powerful tool, there are a few caveats that we should note about its use, which we'll highlight through an example. So this is a six max test hand I played where the small blind raised and I called in the big blind with queen jack off. The flop was queen, 10, eight rainbow, the small blind checked and I checked back. The turn was the ace of diamonds, the small blind bet around 75% pot and I called. The river was a seven of clubs and the small blind overbet around 1.5x pot. And after a long tank, I called and got shown a seven for two pair. According to GTO, my call was a pretty clear error, although it didn't result in a huge EV loss. The solver is showing some frequency of calling with queen jack off, but it's doing so minimally and the EV for calling all of these hands is negative so you can assume that they are just pure folds. One of the factors that I considered in my decision making process was that I thought this particular opponent may have been over bluffing. Now obviously in this instance I ended up guessing wrong, but for the sake of discussion what would have been the most profitable play on average if my assumption about my opponent over bluffing turned out to be true? Well we can use node locking to find out. Now you can't node lock within the GTO check browser, but what you can do is download the file for your solved hands and explore the full game tree and node lock turns and rivers with the free version of simple post flop. So here we're looking at the small blinds perfectly balanced GTO betting strategy on the river and to node lock, all we have to do is right click on the action where we think the player has a leak, select edit strategy, and then a pop up will appear, which will allow us to modify the small blind strategy. So since we want to see how my strategy should change if my opponent is over bluffing, let's isolate the small blinds trash hands. And let's say, for example, that instead of betting 25 big blinds 7% of the time on average with king 6 suited, the small blind was betting 25 big blinds 15% of the time with this combo. We just need to type 15 into this box, click king 6 suited, and then press apply, and now we see these lock icons appear, meaning the strategy has been fixed. And then the last step is to recalculate the river to see how the solver shifts its strategy to exploit this over bluffing imbalance by the small blind. And now we see that my calling frequency shoots up over 2x compared to the GTO calling frequency. When we alter the small blind's bluffing strategy just a tiny bit, 
the impact of the big blind's calling range is quite substantial, including turning queen jack off into a pure call. So obviously node locking is a very powerful tool because it allows us to precisely calculate the optimal way to exploit a known leak. But what about those caveats I mentioned earlier? Well, the first caveat is that what we are doing when we node lock is we are essentially fixing our opponent's leak as a new rule in the game that our opponent must abide by indefinitely. However, in reality, our opponent is free to change his strategy at any time, and if he does and we don't recognize it quickly enough, we will be exposed to counter exploit. So in other words, when we change our strategies away from the baseline to exploit, we are intentionally making our own play imbalanced, which can then be taken advantage of, which node locking does not account for. The second caveat is that when you lock the strategy for a particular node, but leave the rest of the game tree unlocked, the solver will compensate for the handicap strategy by altering its actions in other branches of the game tree to recover as much of the lost EV resulting from the leak as possible. But in reality, if your opponent is significantly imbalanced, it will be highly unlikely that he will be able to adjust and compensate in other branches in the same way as a solver. This means that the strategy that we have node locked and have recalculated our strategy against is not the actual strategy that our opponent will be using. To precisely replicate fixed imbalances in our opponent's strategy, you would actually need to node lock the entire game tree across all possible actions and runouts, which is not possible to do. And the third caveat is that in order to node lock with precision, you need to know the exact imbalance or leak of your opponent, which of course is not knowable. Right, there is no mode with the solver where you can generally lock a player's strategy based on him being loose or tight or bluff heavy. You need to modify specific combos within his range down to the percentage point, which will essentially be an arbitrary guess. And as we saw with our example, when we change the bluffing frequency by just 8% for a single cluster of combos that was only present in the range a fraction of the time, the big blind's calling strategy dramatically shifted by more than double. The upshot of this is that if our guess regarding the imbalances of our opponent's range is wrong, our resulting adjustment could be a huge mistake. So do these caveats mean that node locking is useless? Well, no. Node locking is still the only way to objectively calculate how to exploit an imbalanced opponent, so this tool still can be very helpful if we are thoughtful about how we use it, and I have a few suggested tips on how to do this in a practical way. The first tip is instead of focusing on trying to memorize and implement the specific frequencies produced by the solver after a node lock, we should focus primarily on the direction of the solver's adjustment. For example, in this case, when our opponent bluffs too much relative to his value combos and the size of the bet, the solver's adjustment was to expand our calling range. Now that may be obvious even without node locking, but what is less obvious are the peripheral effects in other nodes of the game tree which the solver can help us identify. For example, instead of my opponent over bluffing, let's assume that I, as the big blind, will always over bluff in this type of spot by 2xing the pot when the out of position player checks to me. At the equilibrium, when facing a small blind check, the solver bets 2x pot around 3% of the time. What happens when we node lock the big blind strategy to 2x the pot with 50% all of its unmade hands? Well, in addition to the small blind increasing its calling frequency significantly downstream, we see that the solver also increases its checking frequency upstream. Right, The big blind's leak only occurs after a small blind check, so the solver stuffs a greater proportion of its range into the checking line to take advantage of this, including by doing more slow playing with its two pairs and top pairs, which will now get additional EV by bluff catching. The second tip is that once we know the direction of our adjustment, we should shift all of our hands that were mixed at the equilibrium to pure strategies along that direction. And the reason for this is that at the Nash equilibrium, to achieve perfect balance and unexploitability, the solver allocates certain frequencies to certain actions and fills up these frequencies in a very precise way by mixing in combos that are at the threshold between such actions. For example, when facing the small blind river bet, the solver allocated just enough combos to calls to avoid being exploited, and that exact defense frequency required that the combos that were the most marginal calls, where the EVs of calling and folding were the same, be played with split frequencies. 
In other words, the solver couldn't just call all of the big blinds marginal hands or else it would be over calling and it couldn't fold all of them or else the big blind would be over folding. So these threshold hands are mixed just enough to get the solver to the appropriate defense frequency. However, once the equilibrium is broken, all the hands that were indifferent and mixing between calling and folding from a GTO perspective will now strictly prefer to call since the solver only mixes strategies between two actions in theory when the EVs of such actions are the same. So when the small blind deviated from his perfectly balanced GTO strategy by over bluffing, even slightly, the EV of the big blind calling will also increase slightly. And since the EV of fold is always zero, this means that all of the board line hands will now be pure calls because in theory, the solver always takes the actions that produce the highest EV. And the third and final tip is that after shifting all of our cutoff hands from mixed to pure, we should assess where the new cutoff point should be based on the degree of our opponent's deviation. The greater our opponent's deviation from GTO, the farther we should adjust our cutoff points, which means that some of our combos may shift from being pure to being mixed, and some of our combos may shift from being pure in one direction to being pure in another direction. For example, in our original node locked hand, the degree of the small blind's deviation was relatively minor. We increased the bluffing frequency of a combo that was in the range a fraction of the time by only 8%, and this resulted in the solver moving the cutoff point for calling to around third pair. But what happens when we increase the bluffing frequency for this one combo to 50%? Well, we see that the cutoff point for the big blind calling is now at weak pair. All of these 8x combos turn into pure calls because their EVs for calling increased a few big blind across the board due to the greater degree of imbalance in the small blind's bluffing range. And this highlights why even when we're facing an imbalanced opponent, knowing the baseline GTO strategy can still be quite useful. Ultimately, the main thing that changes when we exploit an imbalanced opponent is the cutoff point between different actions in relation to our range. All of the fundamental principles that drive GTO strategies such as range advantage, position, SPR, card removal, etc. still apply. And when we are well studied in theory, we will have a better sense of range construction and how these cutoff points should shift due to our opponent's imbalance based on our assessment of where additional EV is being generated from. So that is the video for today. Thanks for watching and until next time, stay balanced.